Right, so three points to improve in health and safety. Culture, uh, we started this last week, and this actually, I think I was able to post this up last week as well. So not to repeat, I think the main thing to know from last week, if I could just find the definition, the main thing from last week to know is really that culture is made up of you, you know, you are an employee in a company, so you come to the company with your ways then, if you want to say it like that, right? You know, the way we do things around here, but you come to the company with your ways, your level of education, your attitude, your age, experience. And the whole concept was, um, if, you know, if your ways, if your attitude, perception was the same of that of the company, and let's hope the company has a good one, right? If it was the same as the company and it is a good one, you'll end up with what is called a positive safety culture. So we saw culture as being two things. It is the product of you, whatever you bring to the company, but also what the company has to offer, right? And when we say group here, and when we say company here, in reality, and we looked at this last week, the group or the company was not a physical building, but it was in fact the managers in the company. So in a way then, the culture of a company is based on what you have to offer, but also what the managers have to offer. We did all of that. We spent a lot of time actually talking about what could the managers do. If you look at the PowerPoints, um, it, it had a focus on management, right? So management could do this, management commitment and leadership. And I think when I said this, I said that um, if you are going to write this, or if you're going to analyze this, you often have to give an example. You can't just say management leadership. You have to say, well, how did they lead? Like, did they take part in um, the toolbox meeting? Did they allocate resources when resources was needed for the health and safety? So it's often not just those taglines, but you have to understand the taglines. And we spent a great deal of time talking about that last week, right? So the, the overall focus on it was management. And to the very end, we looked at the individual. In fact, your homework would have been to think about maybe what is um, eight things you would have contributed to our company. And I did get some homework back. Um, I didn't get all though, right? I know, I know I got one and I didn't, I didn't have a chance to look at, I think it's uh, Nathaniel owners yet. So if he's there, just saying that out loud anyway. It came by yesterday, I think, or the day before. But I didn't get a chance to look at it as yet, right? But typically, in Italian work is actually correct. And in fact, come to think of it, most of your work is actually correct anyway, right? There isn't much stuff in anybody's work that would warrant a cause of concern. In fact, I know Marcus had done a whole set and practically all was correct anyway. I had to really look hard to see if I can find something to actually come up with to see what can be improved on, right? So the answers that we did started last week, um, you know, like what would be the individual factors? And we spoke about things like age, attitude, the person competency, and literally could give anything, right? Um, about a person, the person's, um, um, uh, I'm going to say age, but I said age, but I think the person, maybe the person health could be one. If the person has maybe um, some health problems, that may be, something that is affecting the culture as well, right? Uh, that's a bit maybe difficult to explain, but it's not that difficult if you put your mind to it, right? Maybe one would be easier is maybe the person fears, if you have any fear, like a fear of height. But in your safety or you were put in charge of um, looking at workers at a height, right? Now, because of your fear, then you, you may not go to do your job then, or maybe if it's a confined space or something. So a lot of answers. I think those are really the harder ones I just call their fears and, um, and um, uh, you know, like any health problems that the person may have. The obvious answer is the person's age and experience and education and attitude and values and stuff, right? But uh, like I said, these things are taught um, at the degree level. We do have the degree. The next level to this is level six. Um, it's, it's almost very similar to this. Uh, the, the only thing with the level six is that Instead of coming up with eight answers, you have to come up with 10. So you may hear me throwing something there that may not have been said in this course, then like phobias and stuff, right? But then, but then those are the stuff 
just we, we just gonna add to it to create 10 answers for the degree level anyway right um anyway that's too much i will talk we need to get to today's lesson so i think we left this right here all of that was reviewed right um so we left it here on competence and i think the idea here was that competence then is something that could affect the culture in the company meaning competence on both the employees and the managers and here we had a definition of competence right um i'm not going to spend long on this because this is literally a two mark question if it was to come as to what is competence let me read it out for you they say competence is defined as a person with practical and theoretical knowledge as well as sufficient experience of a particular health and safety aspect to allow for the assessment of the effectiveness in relation to its objectives, targets, and functions. Well, um, I mean, I think the main piece in this, to be honest with you, if you don't want to learn all of that, is that competence, like to be competent, you must have all of this. You must have practical, the practical know-how of getting a task done. You must have the theoretical knowledge, so the theoretical knowledge is like your certificates, and then you must have experience. If you have all three of these in any particular area, which some of us would obviously have, um, it would mean that you are competent in that area, right? I um, Again, not to, just let me try to add someone there, not to tell you um, too much of stories, of course, right? But maybe just one, I remember, just some years ago, again, about 10 years ago, someone had, um, someone had come to do a training for Neil and Massey, and it, it was Neil and Massey at that time anyway, right? I had not told you this story before because I know we share the same stories with, um, with, with the classes anyway. But um, the person in introducing themselves, um, they, they started off by saying that they did not have well, a degree, now this was Massey, right? So you, you expect somebody to come into Massey, train employees, um, must have at least had uh, some sort of certified training. And then because it's Massey, we would have probably look at a degree, but the person started off with that. And that, that to me, and not just to me, but I think to a lot of persons in the training, sort of turned them off because, um, you know, at, at the same time, we don't want the person to have a degree alone. You know, we want them to have the experience. But when you look at it, I mean, if you are in front of a huge company like Massey and all you have is experience, then you are seen to be not competent, right? In the eyes of an auditor, if, if an auditor was to come by and say, well, who did this training for you all? What was the person's qualification? They, they would not have recognized that training anyway. So it, it is really a combination of all three. Likewise, as I said, a degree alone is not it. Uh, you know, you must have the experience. And if you don't know the difference between the experience and the um, and the practical, the experience, sorry, the, the, the practical means that you must be able to do what you had to do and you had to do it. Right? You cannot, um, you, you, you cannot just say that you have the experience. Right? And you have the um get it, get feedback. Right, yeah, that you have the experience and you have the, the like okay, like you have a certificate, but you don't know how to get it done. All right. The, the practical means that you can actually turn off the valve then, right? The practical means that, that if you are a welder, you know, you have the welding certificate, you have you know 10 years experience, but it could weld, right? The practical means that when you weld the well will come out the way it's supposed to come out, right? So if not, if you have any, or if any one of these is missing, I guess as the point of trying is, if any one of these is missing, you are seen to be not competent, right? So it must be a person with the know-how, the certificate, and the experience, and then you are seen to be competent, right? Anyway, long story short, um, there's two marks for exam if they ask you to define it. Yeah, once you hit those points, you'll have to get it correct. And the other piece of it is that this is not a separate part of the lesson. This is still about the individuals in a company that can influence culture, what makes them competent, right? Or what makes the culture in the company good is that they are seen to be competent, right? If we could say it like that anyway, that 
This is all about what about the person, right? So the person is seen to be competent. Anyway, that was just one trailing slide from last week. Believe it or not, that we, we should have actually finished that last week, but I guess time was out on us. That was actually a trailing slide. Um, trying to clear the screen there, right? From last week, right? So I guess really and truly on to today's work now, right? Um, the topic will change slightly, slightly because you'll see what I'm talking about. It still is cold here anyway, right? but it changes slightly a bit here. So um, let, me, let me try to explain this for you a bit, right? Explain like why the topic changed. Now, the topic didn't really change. What they're trying to say now, right, is that if there is that sort of, you know, like unbalance between the employee and the company, if there is some sort of you know, not getting along then between the employee and the company, what could be done to improve the culture? So this is where this lesson picks up. This lesson picks up here, or this subtopic then takes up that if the employee doesn't then fully believe that, you know, safety is my first priority or we're going to reduce accidents to zero, et cetera, what could be done? And the answer is, the answer, what could be done is communication, right? The company, for want of a better phrase, you, you hear me saying this, this last and next week, what they are trying to do here, they will be trying to influence the employee. I don't know if I had done this for this class, but I guess I can do it here now. Um, I perhaps would have wanted a blank slide though, right? But um, I guess I could try to fit it here. Um, when we say, I think I did it last week, when we wrote out the formula, but I need a blank slide or probably need my screen, right? Um, when we said that culture is the product of the individual and the group, right? Um, I could probably find a blank one that has some space in it, right? Uh, instead of going to the whiteboard, right? I guess I have to go to the whiteboard. I'm not seeing any. Um, any space in these, right? But uh, I think I wrote this for myself. I'm gonna go to the whiteboard. Um, what, I think when I wrote this for you last week, I wrote, I wrote not a formula, right? Which was, um, which was culture is, is made up of, or is equal to, right? The individual, right? Culture is made up of the individual and the group values. Now, what I'm trying to show is how the two lessons, they are kind of connected, right? So culture is made up of you and the group values, right? And I think I drew this way. This is like a formula. You can think of it as a mathematical formula because they had used the word product. Product means to multiply. Multiply means to put together, right? So culture is made up of your values and that of the group. Now, what you probably don't know is that if you think about this a bit, right? If these two things here are equal to culture, like two plus two is equal to four, right? The truth though is that unlike two plus two is equal to four, these do not have the same weight. You in a company does not, don't know what happened to that marker there. Um, you in a company, right? I don't know what arrow this is. I'm actually clicking the whiteboard. Um, Right, yeah, so Zoom does give some bit of issue. So you, in a company, you do not contribute 50% to culture, right? And I'll draw maybe a building here, but of course, it's really managers, but I guess a building may give the idea of a group, right? But the thing though, it's not a 50-50 relationship, right? Um, so that's why on the slide that we were on, you see there's a focus on, communication, right? The truth to this is that this is actually represented like, uh, I don't want to rack your brains too much, but it represents this like a Venn diagram. If you remember doing that um, back in high school, right? They represent it like a Venn diagram. And when I say they, it's actually the HSC in the UK, the Health and Safety Executive, right? They represent it like a Venn diagram. And one is a subset of the other one, meaning that one of these here, have a bigger influence on culture. They, it is still equal to culture, right? But it's not a 50-50 relationship, right? It's not that you 
if you think about it a bit, you'll see if you were in a company, let's say you were the one that did your NIBOR certificate and you learn all of this, you get out there in the company though you realize that, you know, everything you learn is not what is being practiced, right? You would realize that you could be fighting up there, you're fighting up to change the system, but you realize that what the managers and them say at the end of the day goes, right? So it's not really that you have 100% same influence and culture, but with the formula never said you alone, it said you and the group. But what you need to know though is that you, uh, you know, would really carry about 30%. There's supposed to be you here, right? It's drawn like a Venn diagram. And um, in the Venn diagram, the person is placed within the organization, right? Just as how it's supposed to be. But what that also means is that the organization have the more influence than or more of the influence. Some people say it's probably down to like 70% is the organization. And then you would normally contribute 30%. And some companies is less, right? You contribute then 30% to the culture anyway, meaning the overall influence on culture. I don't know if anybody want to speculate on that. Um, it, it's a topic for a big discussion. It might be at this level though, right? But um, Simply put, if I could try to tell you how this is, like simply put, if you are in a company, just think of it like you have the NIBO certificate and the company is doing the wrong thing, you would not be able to change all of it. You can make the suggestions. You can say, let's start doing toolbox talks. Let's get somebody trained. Let's get this. And soon as you start that, they will say, you come here to give them trouble, right? They say, you come here to give us trouble, right? And uh, you know, um, I have known a lot of safety persons like that. And um, they leave, right? They, they, they leave and they end up in better companies. Of course, sometimes when they're looking for a job, they start up anyway. But if that is the case where you're not being supported, right? You would leave and go somewhere. So anyway, the point I'm trying to say here is that the bigger influence is that of the organization. And where the lesson takes off on the other slide, right? The lesson takes off with the idea that um, the lesson assumes, so should I say that Nibosh, at least the slant that they take in this course is that they assume that the group has it good, the group have the good values, and you are the one that came to the company with some poor values and some poor attitudes, right? So the lesson takes off from there, Right, I'm not sure what's going on with the marker, but it doesn't take off from there where it's assumed that the, the company has the best of policies, the best of values, and you are the one that you know can be seen as a rule breaker, and it takes off from there where what could they do now to influence you? And if you look at it and you remember your a little bit about maths, like I said, there's a reason why something is a subset of the other one. This is inside here, meaning that you would sooner or later be influenced by the group. You are part of the group then. So whatever the group does, right? Even if you might not agree with it at first, um, maybe for the good, I'm just saying for the good, I'm not gonna assume it's bad. So let's say you did not see the importance of wearing um, your safety glasses during your work day in the machine shop, right? You came in with that idea, you told yourself, or maybe you are that person like me, I tend to sweat under my eyes a bit once I have on a safety glasses. It tends to fog, right? It fogs up a bit, right? Miss, right? It, it, it tends to create a bit of a miss, right? So the, the idea I'm trying to say here is that if that's the case, right, you may not fully believe that the glasses is that important, but as you work from day to day, you see everybody as wearing it, they talk about it in safety meetings, they talk about it in, you know, um, uh, Monday morning meetings, toolbox talks, the supervisor talking about it. So what I'm trying to say <coughs> is that sooner or later, even if you had come in there with, the, with a wrong perception, because you're part of the group, you'll start doing what the group is doing, right? And that is the place where the lesson picks off from. So if I can go back to that, that's what I said, it didn't really change, but it had some explanation as to, as to why uh, we are looking at what we are looking at here, right? So I guess a big um, explanation there, right? So like I said, from here, it's now assumed that you are the one that have something 
again, not where it's supposed to be, and the company will be trying to fix it. So three main types of communication are used within the organization. These are verbal, written, and graphic. By the way, this is straight from your syllabus. And they have your what is communication. So communication is defined as a process by which, you could look at the little diagram there, information is exchanged between a sender, which is the S, and the receiver to gain the feedback. And this is the critical part about communication. Um, it's done before a decision is made, right? So if, um, if you would have been spoken to them, right? Let's say it's a meeting and they say, you know, going forward, we will be requiring all workers to wear safety glasses, but then you never had an input on that. That's not really effective communication, right? If we say going forward from, you know, from Monday, you know, we're gonna have a no smoking policy in the company. Everyone who used to smoke, we're gonna stop that altogether on Monday. Now, if, if, if again, you didn't have a chance to give your views, that's not effective communication. Communication is defined as the process of, you know, exchanging information between the sender and the receiver to gain a feedback before a decision is made. And again, just bear this in the back of your mind that we are still talking about culture. You, I suppose that you will get the employees to do, you know, like maybe to do a toolbox talks, to do their GSAs. If you communicate with them and you hear their feedback, Right? Once they hear somebody's feedback and the person takes part, then the employee will feel as if they are part of the process as opposed to being spoken down to. Right? Remember, all of this is still about culture until I tell you it's not about culture anymore. Right? All of this today, whole class is about culture, right? including next week too. Even though it might look at that, it still is culture. All right, I'm moving on. So, hear what they want from us, right? It is already five to one. I can't believe that, right? Um, here, here, what they want from us, right? If I could just kind of give it a big picture first, right? Here, what they want from us. So what they want from us, if you look at the slides, they have three forms of communication the company can use to influence your culture. And they have verbal. If you look at it, you have written and you have graphic. Now, graphic, um, graphic does hardly come right, for exams anyway. It, it probably has come before, but when it, when graphic shows up for exam, it doesn't show up by itself, it shows up with verbal and written, right? Anyway, the, the point about this is that you could understand that a company would have three ways to talk to you, verbally, written, and graphic. Graphic, if you're unsure about graphic, graphic is like, um, I guess what we do it now, like Zoom, but again, before Zoom, graphic would have been things like, um, in the Monday morning meeting, they would show a video, maybe on somebody getting something stuck in their eye, and then you'd probably start to realize, okay, the safety glasses is really important, right? So graphic communication is part of it, but what they want, right? What, is, what they want from the three forms of communication, they want, they want a lot of stuff in fact. So this may take us some half, maybe hopefully we can finish it. But the first thing they want, right? They actually want what is the problem with it. The first thing they want is what is the problem? They call it barriers. If you look at this slide, right? Like what is the barriers then to verbal communication, right? They love this scenario like where they will tell you an employer, a supervisor, a CEO is, you know, like talking to employees, giving them instructions, but they don't get it. And then they ask you, well, what would have been the reasons why the employee didn't fully hear what was being said, right? So this is an easy question. This is, in fact, if, if you did anything in communication studies back in school days or even social studies, this could be relevant, right? So, and if you didn't do social studies, you could just think of this as in the real workplace that, you know, like the, um, the manager is talking, but not everybody will hear what he's saying. And yes, everybody listening, but everybody may walk out there with the idea, well, you know, when did he really say we want this bio? I didn't quite hear what he was saying. So what he was love for this part of verbal communication, it's right here, they love the barriers, right? So I have them here, if I could read some, and the bottom here have, can you think of any others? So what are the barriers 
to verbal communication. And as I read this, like I said, to tell what I'm telling you, that they love the idea. For those of us who work in, you'll understand this very well, right? That every morning, uh, well, Monday morning, in a company, you have what is called the safety meeting, right? So pity that that because that's the scenario that they normally like to give you that in a safety meeting, someone is talking, but at the end of the day, they may still go and do the wrong thing. So then what went wrong, right? So I have here, I'll give you a start, your barriers of verbal communication. Um, you may need to know up to eight. Uh, this is an eight mark question, right? So if we don't have eight here, um, and I wouldn't want to take the marker and write in the rest because it will take my time. If, if y'all could say it and somebody could write it down, fine, right? But um, I have some here. So what are some of the barriers of verbal communication? You have here um, language and dialect, right? And of course, you know, we do have um, different languages in Trinidad and Tobago. You have the Chinese, um, you have, I guess, Spanish, right? You have... Uh, Mexican, sort of Spanish anyway, right? Um, so language and dialect is one, and by the way too, not too sure if you know this, but um, you also have the Trinidad language, right? You also have our own language, right? That um, if you have ever dealt with any um, uh, expats then, right, from other countries, they have little difficult time understanding what we are saying, right? Simple words that we say, they wouldn't understand and certain things that they say we cannot understand, right? Um, so I'm gonna give you two, two, like two, two simple ones. One, we say in Trinidad a lot is toot. Toot, right? The man was tooting a piece of pipe or tooting a box. And I've, I've been in places where these people, you know, at the end of all of that, they don't know what you mean by toot, right? Toot is like a Trinidad um, version of a word anyway, right? So you also have that, you also have some very close misconceptions like truck. Truck, a simple word as truck, right? Truck, like, um, like we say, you know, that they, they, like the worker was driving a van and he got into an accident, right? And these people would, would not know what you're talking about because there is no vans in the company, right? What you have is trucks, what we call vans in Trinidad Around the world, it, it is really a truck, right? Like the Hilux, Navaras, whatever. Have you visited the company? Please made an accident with the van and they're looking for the van, which part the van is, right? But it's really a truck, right? So, use of technical language, I guess that is self explanatory. If you use, um, you know, again, even I guess Trinidad technical language, right? But, uh, but typically here, yeah, it's, re it's, really, it's really technical language, like, um, like the name we use for certain forms, like RAs. Risk assessment, of course, right? Um, PTWs, permit to work, and the one I mentioned before, JSAs. Uh, the company may know all of that, but what if, what if there's a new employee there, right? Um, you also have, for those of us who work, you have various companies add some twists to risk assessment. There's actually one I know that um, BP. Shell and Atlantic, and they, they have created this something called a TBRA. T as in task, B as in base, risk assessment, TBRA. But they talk it's as, as if everybody know what they're talking about. You, you hear them talk about TBRA, TBRA. And, you know, sometimes if you're not familiar with that sort of setting, you don't know what they're saying. A TBRA, for want of a better um, explanation, is really a JSA. It is really the same thing, but they created their own slang tab, right? Abbreviations, background noise. I'm trying to check on my fingers so much at this. So that's one, two, three. Again, this could be four. Technical language, abbreviation, background noise, distractions, hearing problems. So that's six, right? Anybody could come in with maybe two more barriers to communication, or you can just think of it as, which is the same thing. I'm using the proper word in this slide, which is barriers. But um, like, why would a worker not hear the verbal instruction given to him in a meeting? It's the same thing anyway, it's the same concept. Like what is two more reasons why they would not be able to hear? Do we have hearing problems there already? And we already have distractions and background noise and stuff. If, if you're working, you probably know the answer for one of them. Let's think about the meeting that you went to last Monday. Repetitive. 
Okay, so repetitive. Okay, so I'll kind of add to that. So what I'm not hearing with the idea of repetitive is that they probably fed up here in the same thing, meaning that they bored, right? So even if, you know, as we say in Trinidad, to talk about abbreviations and dialect, you know, it, it, it comes in one ear and goes through the other ear, because they are bored and they have heard you said this so much of times without any action taking place, they will just tune you out, right? So you can probably put there the person as bored. Uh, any more again? If you, if you have been in a meeting, you'll know. I what? think cell phone. Say it again. Cell phones. Distractions. Distraction. Okay, well, we have distractions there. So yes, Natalia, but I think cell phones will fall under distractions, right? I think um, maybe to end it here, one of the answers is the person could be fatigued and tired. As I, as I said, if you're working, you're lucky, know that. Right, that the person could be fatigued. The person may have worked a twelve-hour shift. Um, God forbid, wasn't relieved and working another twelve-hour shift. And before they go home, which is it is how it is on most process plants anyway, right? Um, nutrient, which was PCS, nitrogen, where proman is there now. That's a common thing anyway. Um, shift, you know, shift work anyway, and then just before you go, you have to do a handover. So you may be in this meeting, but you would have had, you know, a very long time on your feet or at least a very long time waking anyway. So yes, you're there, but you're fatigued, you're tired, you're stressed. So if you want to add that there, that is a very good one to make the eight. Now, there may be other answers. Um, I think if you have your books, your books would have done this excellent. Just that they find these things on the table of contents. Um, verbal written graphic is on your syllabus, so it will be in the table of contents. If you find them, they normally have them listed out. But again, you know, my approach is to get you to just think about them. If the person here, they say repetitive things, fine. If the person is on your phone, fine. That's a means of distraction, right? All of those are perfect answers. Um, you know, so at least when you come up with them, you have heard me say this in every video. When you come up with them, you do have to go to the book and cram it. Especially when you open the book and you see the same thing. You see the same, you know, boredom and whatever have you, right? Anyway, I'll leave this one because I have, we have to do three, right? So the other one, anyway, getting the idea that there's a kind of tighten again that if the person's perception was poor, what could have been done to change the culture? We said you could have meetings and this could have been via verbal communication. I have all the meetings listed on this slide for those of us who just listen and I'll read it out for you. Um, this can often take the form of, and this is the verbal I'm talking about, this can often take the form of a toolbox meeting or team briefing safety circles discussion groups the point about this is that you're talking to the person it's all verbal communication right there is a passage by here but i don't want to stop if you all want to have a look at that fine right i don't want to stop until i finish our graphic right um so i'm moving on right so the other form of communication remember i said it's three it's verbal written and graphic the other one is written communication right um in that they can try to change your perception now. So they've spoken to you, but there's written stuff around the company, right? That could influence your perceptions. I'm gonna just read out what I have here. So you'll get an idea for those of us who just listening in, right? So written communication can take many forms, such as memos, the employee handbook, job descriptions, so work procedures and reports, right? So just gonna sort on there. So if you know, like when you join the company, the first day, in fact, they will do an orientation with you, which will be the verbal piece, but they will give you an employee handbook, or at least they should, they'll give an employee handbook. They will most likely give you your, your job description. So you see who you're reporting to. And in your first week of any work, they normally give you the procedures to run through. Well, this, this is the book of procedures familiarize yourself with the ones that pertain to you, right? So it's written instructions. And I also have their memos as well. Could be, you know, a means of, of giving you written communication, right? Now, I, again, I know Natalia and I see like a driver, so I want to kind of shout out these to you anyway, right? On this syllabus though, right? On this syllabus. I'm not driving. Okay, not driving. Okay, all right. At least by in a vehicle, right? Okay. So, um, yeah, so on this syllabus though, let's admit 
right? Yeah, on the syllabus, in addition to the written communication that I just said, they have specified the notice board on your syllabus, right? They specify the, the, the notice board as a means where you can find written communication, right? So the second point I have here says, most common is the notice board. This be yeah. well positioned, reviewed and updated regularly to maintain its effectiveness. And to the bottom of this, I have a passive question from before that asks for, they wanted to know what is eight items, well, of written communication that could be placed on a safety notice board. This was a very famous passive question, right? So if written communication is a means of changing your perception, what could be eight actual paper then or paperwork that they could stick onto the notice board that could help you, you know, understand the values of the companies and stuff. So I don't know if anybody want to give me an answer for this. I believe the answers are here. Just I didn't want to show it, right? But um, anybody could just pull this some memory. Like what would you, what, you know, like if you join a company, what would you find in the notice board that could probably help you you know, know something about that company safety culture. We kind of did it. I'll give you a clue. We did it two weeks ago. A, a policy statement. Very good, right? So one of the first things you'll find, you'll find, I think I mentioned here, flow and, well, the non-industry is not, for those of us who are not working, so that at least you'll have an idea of how common that was. So flow and the next time you go to flow or TNT, go if you're not going because of the virus anyway. But if you, if you remember going, right, uh, Every one of those companies, those big utility companies, WASA, they have the policy um, statement uh, normally blown up and they have, if they have it, they have it on the wall, right? So likewise, though, for the companies, for the industrial companies, though, we normally have that on the notice board. They'll have something like, we are Demos Oil. We are committed to ensuring your health, safety, and welfare, providing, you know, um, a safe working place for you, welfare facilities, so yes, the health and safety policy statement is one such document you'll find on the notice board. Anybody can give me one more, and I think I have them listed here. If not, I'll have to show them for you. Um, yes, I actually have them listed here, right? So let me just take them from here anyway, right? So um, the first point I have here is something called the health and safety poster. Now, we do not have this in Trinidad, but this is a law in England, right? They have a mandatory poster that they have to put up, right? If you have the green book, I know it's in the green book, but if you wanted to see it, all you could probably do is just put that into Google, the health and safety law poster. That is a law in England that they have to put up that um, throughout the company. Well, not throughout, but in the notice board of the company for the employees. I suppose for us in Trinidad, you could probably think of that, but please remember, this is not law in Trinidad. You could probably think of that as um, maybe, sorry, maybe the duty of the employees under the OSHAC, right? I know OSHA does put out um, pamphlets, so I could probably use the word pamphlets, they are posters. Um, so that's what that is like, like they are actually required to put up like the rights of the employees on the notice board, the right to refuse unsafe work, right? The right to cooperate with the employer, etc. So that's like what that is there. But um, think of that as how it is in Trinidad that you know we would have um, OSHA brochures, and that is like what that is there. But it's really a, a post that they have in the UK, and the employers are required to put it up. Some stuff you find in the notice board again, um, details of the first aid arrangement. Again, if you're working, you'll know this one on the HSE notice board, you'll be fine. Like, who is your first aider, right? If it's a big company and they would have broken you all off into groups or departments, you'll have who is the first aider for your department, right? So the first aider. Um, third point here, details about the HSE targets and actual performance against them. Now, I can read it again, but I'll tell you what it is. Details about the HSE targets and actual performance against them. Now we do have that in Trinidad, but they call it something else. They call it KPIs, Key Performance Indicator, right? This is a lesson coming up, I guess, way 
I guess any months ahead. But if you don't know what a KPI is, a KPI is, um, is like a spreadsheet from January to December, and it'll have in it the number of accidents you have, hopefully zero the number of property damage. And that has never be zero, by the way, right? The number of injuries, number of fatalities, hopefully again, that is zero. But that's what that is, right? And um, that is going to be published on the notice board, right? Why it's published is because it changes from month to month as the figures are tallied from one month to the other month, right? So if you have um, any doubts, I guess you could remember this as KPI for now. You'll get it correct because you see it's performance, right? KPI is performance standards anyway until we do that lesson anyway. But think of it as um, it's a spreadsheet, 12, 12 months, and uh, you're recording it, what happens for the month anyway, in terms of accidents and incidents. I have health and safety posts here, so this is a repeat of the first point. This could have been my error here. Uh, or it could have been just a normal poster. I think that's what I wanted to say, that the one on top was the low poster, but this one here could have been just your poster. Somebody could have made up a poster about the importance of safety glasses or, you know, um, taking some pictures and, you know, created a poster, or maybe download one, but it's not illegal poster then. So this is something that you add in there um, that could go on the notice board. Minutes of the last safety committee meetings could be, um, it's not about two pages anyway, so that could be photocopied and stuck to the notice board. So the employee could have known what would have been said in the committee meetings. Again, if this is, a bit confusing to you. The committee meetings here is a safety committee meetings, and that is held once a month, right? So if, um, and the committee, by the way, is not all employees. A committee could be five persons, six persons, very big, com very big companies, you know, 200 and more workers and stuff. The committee may still be about 15. But if you are not part of the committee, but you want to see what they talk about, seeing it as a safety committee, you can look for the minutes of the last safety committee, right? Um, this is an easy one, emergency evacuation. Uh, like the, okay, like the map, the, the evacuation map is not being found on the notice board. And the persons with any responsibility for, you know, like, like who is the fire marshal, who is the first aider, et cetera. Those persons will be on the, um, on the evacuation map itself. The last one, I don't know if um, we really do this in Trinidad, but you need a copy of the Employer's Liability Insurance Certificate. And this, when we did this in chapter one or lesson one, we had said that this is like the workmen compensation that is required in Trinidad and Tobago here. All employers must be paid what is called workmen compensation and public liability insurance, right? So um, that is, again, if you remember that lesson, that is like um, comforting to know that if something happens to an employee and they take the employer to court, that they will be getting money from the insurance. And I see in this and I know that I have not really seen this in a lot of companies, right? But I know they have it, a lot of companies have it. The employer's liability insurance certificate, um, you know, saying that, that the employees are insured then while they are on the company's premises, right? Anyway, the UK may be a bit different. They are saying that a copy of that must be on the notice board. So let me see if we have got the eight here. So the health and safety poster, first aid arrangements, KPIs, another poster which could be company made or could be downloaded, minutes of the meeting, emergency um, evacuation, map and the person, Yes, and have it here, right? Employer's liability insurance. I still have here any others that you all can think about. Um, I guess if you look at the book, you may be able to come up with it. Um, I could probably end this little piece by saying because it's already now 17 minutes past, right? It's about 20 minutes past. I could probably end this piece by saying that um, if, if you were to give this question a try, right? I say an if, right? Because you don't have to. Um, the, the key to it was not putting anything there that is not safety related. You notice in some companies, items may end up on the notice board and that's not safety related. Like they may have a hike, right? They have a, a hike up in Maracas coming up, right? But they put that on the notice board, but it's not safety related. It's more like hobby 
those who want to take part on that any weekend or whatever have you, right? So this is the key to it, that you can, you can put a lot of answers on the notice board, but it must be safety information, right? If you put anything here, if you look at all these answers here, they are all health and safety, health and safety, health and safety, right? Um, I think, I suppose maybe well, health consideration is one. You know, again, if you look at every company's workplace now, they have something about COVID-19 and wearing your mask and washing your hands. So that would work because that is still health, right? It may not be safety or that or the occupational safety then. It's still a safety in a way. But the, um, the health posters would actually work as well. So if you're just, you know, scratching your brain for one, that is a nice one. And um, I sure could think of others, but that's the eight, so I'll have to move on anyway before I overdo that one, right? So just let me clear this up again. Um, this was about written communication, and it started off like written. It started by talking about everything written, memos and employee handbook and job description, but then Nibosh twisted it into the notice board, right? The notice board is specified in your textbook and on the syllabus that you have to know eight pieces of information, not really in the handbook or in the memo, but they specify the safety notice board, right? If I could just um, take two minutes because I want to go to a graphic. If I could still specify, there's another form of this question, right? If I could, um, there's another version of this question came that asks, um, what was the advantages and the disadvantages of using notice board? I don't know if I have that anyway here. Right? Probably not, but I just said it. Oh, it's probably on that graphic. But I just telling you, right? As a passive for question, they are asked here, what was the advantages? Maybe you could probably try to scribble that down. And the disadvantages of using notice boards. And think about it, those are eight maps. You need four advantages and four disadvantages. I don't want to overdo it. Oh, it's gone so fast, right? Um, you know, just to let you know, like an advantage is um I suppose it is cheap, you know, it's cheap to set up a notice board, uh, just so they probably buy it for the first time anyway. Um, so it could be, I mean, I wouldn't say they were cheap for exam, I said they were cheap because of, of Trinidad um, dialect anyway, but you have to say it's, it's, it's inexpensive. And um, you can probably say things like, you know, it could be placed, I mean, like given the fact that you have a chance to use a poster, um, you know, it means that um, they could create it with colors and graphics and whatever. Have you. So it could be eye-catching then. It could create it to be attractive. You know, um, you could use pitiers. And if you have a pity of maybe someone with um, something, I mean, God forbid, I just say it's a pity, like something stuck in them or something stuck in their eye or something. And next day you have, please wear your safety glasses. I mean, people will get the idea that, hey, Safety classes is important, right? So those are two advantages, but the disadvantages, I wish I had time to take, maybe next week I could continue with it, right? But um, the disadvantage would be things like a poster or a notice board. Then, if you think of it in reality, like the one in flow, I often remember the one in flow because the one in flow, um, well, where they have the safety, the safety statement, that it's always been blocked with the latest movie. Right, the latest movie now they have like a, a, a blown up full size picture of maybe the latest uh, James Bond movie or something. So the safety policy is there on the wall, but nobody can see because it's being blocked with the latest item. So I guess you could think of the same thing for the company that they may have a notice board, but then you may have deliveries. Um, a company may have, well, your supplier may have come on unpacked boxes of supplies. So the notice board is there and you did pin up on it. We have a meeting. That's making this up. So they have a meeting maybe um, on the morning and they put it on the notice board, right? They expected everybody to see it. But Friday, uh, a delivery truck came by, offloaded everything and it, it blocked the notice board, right? So notice boards have that disadvantage and they can be easily blocked. And I'll give you one more. I, I, I really tried to talk as fast as I could, but still sound audible, right? Another one is um, the notice board could be defaced, right? Like what you put on it, someone could have come and, um, you know, tear it down, right? Um, I don't know if you all have ever done this 
but I've seen it done, you know, like, you know, like yeah, we have these certain advantages that you can put up. You could have you put like the person who is responsible for first aid, but imagine you take a really nice pity and you put it up there, then someone comes and they draw on it, they draw a mustache, they draw two horns, that in your teeth, etc. right? So a disadvantage is that as much as, I know that used to happen a lot in Petrotrin, and I can't say they kind of think they used to put any posters on this Zoom class here in Petrotrin, right? When it was Petrotrin anyway, right? But um, that was a common thing you'll find like in um, Santa Flora, etc. where once you would have put up a pitier, you'll find that pitier during the course of that week would be defaced anyway by the not so happy employees, right? So I want to move on. Um, that's about five minutes there. So if you could have talked about that one, um, if you want to do a question, you could, you could do the same one on this slide, but this one is done already. The most you can do with this, if you were doing this one on this slide, is do it over in a full sentence. But if you wanted to do one, um, the advantages and the disadvantages of using a notice board, right? As I, I kind of give it two answers in each day. I just need two more in each, and you should be able to come up with it. All right, um, so I'll skip this one. This is about written communication again. We kind of covered all of that. Um, but I could read one of it. They said, need to consider a person who have poor English reading skills, other limitations, the class to discuss. We don't have time to discuss all of it, right? I would have said most of it anyway. So the last one, graphic communication. To be able to finish, I would just have to read, right? Now, this is the easiest one, right? In case you missed what I said in the beginning, graphic is by means of the projector, you know, um, sessions like these, Skype, Zoom, graphic is all about that, right? So this is communication by means of drawings, photographs, videos, films, the company's internet, and devices that utilize some means of electronic or digital media. The advantage is that they can be used to attract and retain the attention of the participant. The reason would be why that's an advantage is because it's a video. A video may have been created with sound and sound effects and stuff, right? Um, it can also be updated readily to ensure that the information disseminated is relevant and simple. Disadvantages, if you all see in this slide, um, if not, you can just read it out, is that there may be too much reliance on electronic media as opposed to face-to-face -face communication may result in the loss of a personal touch. Right? So, by the way, this is written before COVID-19, right? You know, um, I think having you Zoom, just to be honest with you, I don't think, I don't think that happens on Zoom, right? I think on Zoom, it's just like seeing you all in class, you all take part. Whenever I say take part, you all are taking part, right? Um, the only thing good about it is that, you know, we are home, everybody is home, and that is, you know, convenient. Right, uh, but I think then this wasn't. I mean, I, I don't even know if Zoom was a catchphrase when I wrote this. Zoom may not have been invented yet, right? Um, when I wrote this PowerPoint, right? But uh, I think this could have been more meant for things like using videos, right? Um, uh, or maybe using just like sending those uh, like a video session. Then, but Zoom is interactive. It's designed to be interactive, so I don't think that is an issue with. With, with Zoom, right? Of course, again, the second one is easy. A big disadvantage of graphic communication is that if power was to go, but then when has it fast today? So power failure, all right? Electricity there, right? Power failure. Um, unable to see the message due to fine print. Again, I don't think that's a problem. Zoom and overcome all of that. But it would have been a problem if you watched this on a projector and you were sitting to the back of the class, right? Poor positioning of electronic mediums, such as a projector leading to a disability glare, right? So um, who knows if we, if Nibosh will have us update these things anyway, but I guess that I think those things will remain unless if they take it off this syllabus, right? And that's it. That is the end of the verbal written graphic. I guess in the three minutes, what I could just do is just try to let us see how it made some sense, right? That in reality, the three means of communication wasn't three separate subtopics. It was a topic that was meant to say, if by some chance that Venn diagram thing I had drawn, if I could squeeze it, I don't know where I'm getting 
space on this side, right? But if the Venn diagram I had drawn, if the company, the bigger circle is taken to be the company, right? I'll put here C. This little one was taken to be you. Oh, Ben. Oh, you, right? If, um, if, if you came to a company with, let's say, a poor attitude, the verbal written and graphic was taken to mean, how could the company then change you? How could it change? Well, you for the better, right? How could it change your values? And the answer was they can talk to you. That would have been verbal, right? Um, they could write stuff to you, like written notes and memos and give you procedures and then you have graphic, right? If you look at it, though, for those of us who have been to safety meetings, you would realize that we use all three. We utilize all three in a safety meeting, including today, I guess. I mean, you have verbal. You have, I am writing here with this marker. And you have the form of presentation is a graphic as well. So typically, a company would use all three to kind of try to get you where you're supposed to be there, try to get it to where the safety glasses see the importance of doing the JSA before the job and not after the job. A lot of companies do that, right? The um, JSA is meant to be done first, but they do it after they come back from a job on lunchtime, which is what defeats the purpose of getting the hazards of the task, right? So they kind of do all three. And I mean, once that is done, we'll enter the lesson here. It is hope now that you, the person, would be right, right? That you would now be, that your values are now be in line with the company. It would now be that you are doing what they tell you to do. And in that sense, it end up with the formula again, you and the company working together, ending up with a positive safety culture, right? So I'll end it here next week. If you have this slide, you'll see um, next week. It looks like a different topic again, but it's not, right? It's the same thing, right? Now, um, I think I know last week I had posted this up Saturday itself. Uh, I would try as soon as it's converted to post it up. Next week, lesson, if you can get this slide to go. Next week, lesson is all about um, consultation. Now, and it's the same thing. It's, it's, it's about how do they change your culture? It's all about consultation next week, right? It's still the same thing. A bunch of subheadings though, but it is all within this chapter of culture, right? Hopefully, I know I got a little feedback this week. Um, you know, I won't call any name because I know you're online. So one of the students here was at the office and uh, she remarked that, you know, the work is getting easier. You know, it seems to be easier anyway. It's not as hard as, um, as the first lesson anyway. And that's the idea. I didn't mention that to you, that the rest of it, I mean, typically, if you had done, you know, like any work with social studies or anything in sociology and uh, anything like that, or, or economic studies, you'll find like the work is kind of getting better. But it's it's fairly much easy to understand that there are barriers to communication, verbal, written, graphic, and um, and it's pretty much that is where the rest of the class will go. I mean, till the very end, right? The rest of it has an end. Um, same concepts, then it gets into things like risk assessment, which is really um, a form to fill out, right? PTWs and stuff. So it isn't that hard. Um, the hardest piece of it, though, would have been um, what you covered already, right? So let me just try to, to just poke something here. It's already one to T, right? Um, not to leave these things aside. You, you have heard me say, when we reach the risk assessment part of the course, a nice thing to do would be for us to pause the teaching and take a look at the project that you have to do so that you can give it a try, right? So the reason I tell you that is because you heard me say risk assessment, and believe it or not, risk assessment is this element. Risk assessment is element three. Right? So I think by August month will be, once we cover the theory then, I think a good thing to do, and for those who know, or if you don't know, I know we have some, some folks who, you know, would have been on this new syllabus then as compared to the old syllabus. To pass the course, you have to get the project done and then there's one exam. But you can do the project once we finish the project part of it, which is maybe about two weeks away, right? So keep that to the back of your mind that that's what I would do. I would, um, I, say, I mean, to move, once you finish elementary, you just have one more element to go, which is element four. And it wouldn't make sense to do element four, and then we forget what you learned in elementary, 
I didn't have to come back to it at the end. The sense of putting to Ruby to take maybe about two sessions, do the project, and then in the background, you all could get it done in your own time, right? So you could, you know, get a project done, send it to me. In the meantime, after that two project session, I would continue the teaching, but at least you could be doing that in the background. And yes, 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 as they say three times, we do look at drafts. I've mentioned that to you all many times. Um, we welcome drafts, you know, all the time. So once you do it, it will be perfect. Let me see it. We'll kind of work it out from there. And, uh, you know, we try to get, you know, your best possible um, draft. Of course, most of the work, I mean, the work is yours, but I'm just saying that I would be looking at drafts. Some schools don't look at drafts. We will be looking at drafts, you know, to give you some sort of feedback, right? So that's how this is going. Um, at least for August month, I mean, today is the 18th. So just to let you know, like, maybe where this will be going. You should be finished somewhere around September. And then I think by that time, we'll have a better idea of when could be the next possible exam. Please note, if you haven't heard me say this before, it's probably because I actually say it in the other classes and I would have forgotten to say it to you all. There is an option to do an open book exam. I know we mentioned that here in this class already, but um, so far, I think uh, no one, well, I shouldn't say that, right? I mean, let's, let's kind of step back a bit. Um, in my present class, I have two persons willing to do it and I have signed them up. So no one in this class then should be the guinea pig, right? My present class, which is another third class I have, um, they would be, you know, the ones that would be the first other students writing this open book exam. I should probably stop the recording because these things are not relevant to the folks who are not part of our school.